to introduce the concept of game theory. Game theory is a fascinating subject that is useful in mathematics, it's useful in economics, in political science, even in biology and a variety of other disciplines. It's also very useful in ethics for a variety of reasons that we're going to talk about today. So why is it fascinating? Well, partly because it tells us so much about human interactions and partly because games are fun and analyzing games is really, really useful. So this entire field has to do with not just games we think of as games like chess, checkers, video games, board games, sporting games like football, baseball, basketball, and so on, a variety of human interactions, things that we engage in all the time, whenever we're in groups of people. And so it's useful to think about those kinds of group interactions, how in particular we try to attain our goals when the results of our actions depend on the actions of others. Aristotle described our function as rational activity, acting according to a rational plan, an active life of the element that has a rational principle, he says. Well, what does that mean? We act according to rational plans. We seek ends, we choose means in order to attain those ends, and then we actually act, putting those plans into practice. So we can say that typically in engaging in what is our characteristic human function, we are striving to attain a goal. We're trying to get what we want, whatever that happens to be. It's not the job of game theory to analyze what we ought to want, but it is the job of game theory to figure out how we can rationally go about making decisions. We're going to be studying in particular strategic thinking. What do I mean by strategic thinking? Well, thinking about situations in which the outcome does depend not only on my actions, but on the actions of other people. That frequently happens in groups. In fact, it's the norm. So we're going to study conflict. We're going to study cooperation. Conflict and cooperation between intelligent, rational decision makers. The entire theory, notice, is relatively new. It was developed by the computer scientist and mathematician John von Neumann and an economist, Oscar Morgenstern, in the 1940s. So it's a very new sort of discipline. Nevertheless, just in the last 75 years, 11 different game theorists have won Nobel Prizes. So it's been a hugely fruitful intellectual undertaking. Why are we, in a course on ethics, thinking about game theory? It's because, as I mentioned a moment ago, it is so useful for studying human interactions. That's what ethics is about primarily, but it's also really useful for ethics in more specific ways. For one thing, as Thomas Hobbes was the first to perhaps to stress, considerations of self-interest can actually lead to ethical constraints. In fact, many Hobbesians think that ethics is itself the result of agreements we reach as a result of seeking our own ends in a self-interested way and finding that we can do that best when the behavior of others is constrained and thereby more predictable. So one justification for ethics, and one way of seeing ethical norms as arising, is by looking at that strategic interaction among people who are pursuing rationally their own self-interest. That happens in a lot of individual settings, quite apart from general considerations of ethics. That is to say, the norms, informal norms, as well as formal norms that govern a group, may well arise from individuals within that group seeking their own self-interest rationally and finding together that it makes much more sense and that they're going to be much more successful in attaining their ends if everyone's behavior is constrained in certain ways. The second reason it's useful is that cooperation can emerge in situations that don't seem at all conducive to cooperation. A classic example discussed by Robert Axelrod in his book, The Evolution of Cooperation, took place among the armies in World War I. The very first Christmas, the people in the trenches on the Western Front who had been facing each other for extended periods of time declared a truce at Christmas and all came out of the trenches into no man's land and celebrated Christmas together. They agreed there would be no attacks, no shelling, no firing of weapons and so on during Christmas Day. Subsequently, truces periodically broke out on the Western Front. It infuriated commanders on both sides but it was highly rational on the part of the troops. Now they were in opposing armies and it would be surprising in a way to find that this sort of truce emerges from the soldiers themselves. 
not from politicians, reaching some negotiated settlement. But it happened as a result of considerations we'll look at in game theory. Finally, there are important questions of institutional arrangements. How do we encourage, or for that matter, discourage cooperation? We can sometimes set up institutions and set up situations in such a way that people are encouraged to cooperate. In other settings, people are really discouraged from cooperating. When we want cooperation, we want to structure our institutions in such a way that people are encouraged to behave well, to behave ethically, to cooperate. On the other hand, there are kinds of cooperation that are bad. We don't want collusion. We don't want cartels. We don't want, in many cases, the kind of vote trading that leads to disasters in Congress. And so what we want in some situations is to actually discourage cooperation. And we'll find ways of doing that, find ways of encouraging but also of discouraging cooperation. 